and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. I'm an independent consultant, hands-on software architect, and also the founder of developer2architect.com. In today's lesson, number 55, we'll take a look at one of my favorite tools of architecture, architecture decision records. Architecture decision records were coined by Michael Nygaard, and he says this about those, quote, we will keep a collection of records, those are architecture decision records, for architecturally significant decisions. In other words, those decisions we need to make as an architect, and he defines these so well. Those decisions that affect the structure, that would be the overall style of architecture, whether we're doing microservices, microkernel, service-based, or layered, the non-functional characteristics, those are the illities, dependencies, and this would be between services or components, interfaces, including APIs, or construction techniques, which might include processes, procedures, or even the platform or language that we're in. And so let me show you how powerful an architecture decision record can be. Um, but let's define them first. <clears throat> These are the basic sections that Michael Nygaard has defined within an architecture decision record. An architecture decision record is a short text file, usually one to two pages long, that contains only one decision. So in other words, each architecture decision that you make would have a corresponding architecture decision record, or ADR. Usually these ADRs are written in some sort of markdown, textile, or ASCII doc kind of format. There's no reason you couldn't use plain text as well, except the markdown's useful, and I'm going to show you that when actually I show one rendered. Um, in uh, a wiki or a browser. There's five core sections that Michael Nygaard has identified, and I'm going to show you a couple of others that I've actually added myself when I use these. Uh, the first is a title. It's a short noun phrase that's numbered that ex describes the actual architecture decision. And then the status, whether it's proposed and needs to be approved by an architecture review board or your boss, accepted, or superseded. I'm going to get into the superseded when I show you some tools that you can use. Uh, the context really describes the problem and why I am needing to make this architecture decision. I also usually include in the context some of the alternative choices as well. The decision section is probably the most important. This is actually your architecture decision uh, combined with all the justifications and finally consequences. In other words, when you make an architecture decision, there's consequences, good or bad, associated with those, and that forces us to think about those and document them as well. Two additional sections that I usually add. Um, one is uh, metadata. In other words, who's the author of this? Um, when was it approved? Who approved this architecture decision? If it was modified to change anything, um, when was it modified and by whom? And so that hashtag, hashtag, or equals, equals, if you're doing ASCII doc, uh, metadata or notes is a usually another good one. A uh, second one that I've been recently adding quite a bit is measurements for compliance or measurements. In other words, when I make an architecture decision, I'm going to document how I'm actually going to measure this using some sort of automated or manual fitness function. Let's take a look at an ADR. <laughs> Here's our scenario. We've got an HTTP client coming into some sort of integration hub, for example, Mule, using a RESTful call. Now, in the back end, we've got a customer information system. And basically, that HTTP client wants some customer information. Well, in the scenario here, that back end customer information system that you see there can only be accessed through JMS, and specifically here using ActiveMQ. And so this is the scenario where the integration hub does that protocol transformation from REST over to messaging to be able to get that customer information. Now, one of the requirements was to federate the hub. In other words, instead of just internal calls, we're also going to expose some of that customer functionality to external and also B2B through other Mule instances here or integration hubs. And this is just due to really the availability and throughput. Now, that decision was made and approved. <clears throat> we have to make a choice. Should we use dedicated broker instances? In other words, have a cluster of ActiveMQ instances per Mule cluster, or should we have a centralized ActiveMQ cluster? When we make this architecture decision, it's really important to be able to show the alternatives and justify it. 
Let's actually write this ADR. And so this is going to be ADR number 21. And so notice this is the title, it's numbered, Centralized Message Broker for Federated Gateway Hub. Here's all my sections right here on the basic one. Uh, the status is accepted, so this has been approved. Uh, the context is where I can actually now describe the problem and the alternatives. For example, the incoming gateway hub is federated into three separate hubs. Access to the customer information functionality in the application is only through JMS. The two options are used centralized broker or to use dedicated broker instances. Now watch the decision here. This is in kind of uh, uh, Michael Nygaard form. Uh, it was odd at the start by saying, we will do this. It was kind of weird at the start, but now I use it all the time. How many times have you made an architecture decision? I think centralized message brokers would be best. Well, that's great, but what's your decision? You know, too many times as architects, we make decisions without that affirmative. And thank you, Michael Nygaard, <laughs> because now we have an affirmative. We will use a centralized message broker instance. That's my decision. But now I need to justify it as well. For example, we currently have low request volumes. In other words, what do you mean low? 200 requests a second and anticipate this will remain stable for the foreseeable future. Therefore, we don't see a performance bottleneck because that's one of the first things anybody who's going to challenge you would see. Also, we will leverage the, we notice the we will, <laughs> we will leverage the ActiveMQ failover protocol coupled with clustered broker instances to address the single points of failure. Look at the consequences though. Now, by doing this, the customer information application only requires a single connection. You see, if we use dedicated instances, I would have to have three connections in that application. And now, because there's only one connection, the gateway hubs can be expanded and consolidated without any coding changes. In other words, if we say, hmm, you know, that wasn't such a good idea, there's no changes to the application because it's just a single connection to that ActiveMQ instance. And Consequently, the application doesn't need to be concerned about where the request came from. Now, this is I'm showing in plain text. If you use some sort of markdown or ASCII doc or text style, um, this is what you can do with the formatting in a wiki. <coughs> Notice here I can also add figures and diagrams to describe the problem. I can separate out kind of the alternatives and discuss those. And so you notice that it's more kind of a formatted um, mm, uh, documentation really about that architecture decision. There's a really um, cool automated way of managing ADRs and that's through ADR-Tools on GitHub. And notice here on ADR Tools, this is a command line interface. And so what we have to do is initialize it with where do I want to put these ADRs? It's some sort of directory structure. Now that's usually attached into some sort of GitHub repo um, so that I can actually version any modifications I make to these, not necessarily changing the decision. Um, but if it's proposed, I want to change it to accept it and have some notes about that. And so watch this, here's the command line. ADR space new space, and then I just simply describe that decision. Centralized broker for hub. And here's what happens with these ADR tools. What will happen is it will bring up your favorite editor, whichever editor you, you specify, and it will actually create ADR-021, that's the next one, .md for markdown, and it will bring that up in your editor. If I choose to say, mm, we made a mistake, really it should be dedicated, I don't change ADR21. You see, that was history of why I made those decisions. That's important to know. And so now what I do here is say ADR new dash S for supersedes, 21 dedicated broker. And here's what ADR tools will do. And this is cool. It will create 22, which is the next ADR. And it says in that file that it supersedes 21. And then it takes 21 and it says superseded by 22. So that if I go into 21, it will mark that that's actually been superseded. So this is no longer a valid architecture decision. ADRs are so powerful, everyone. I really encourage you to use these. Try them out, experiment with them, add any sort of sections you want, but just make them simple. And that was really the spirit of these. Um, if you want to see the kind of the full blog, um, I've provided the link there in Michael Nygaard's um, uh, blog about 
these architecture decision records. And you can get more information about other aspects of software architecture by going to Software Architecture Monday, which is on my website, developertoarchitect.com slash lessons, where these all these video lessons are located. And also um, upcoming events, um, places where I'm speaking at conferences or trainings, um, public trainings, on my website at upcomingevents.html. And so this has been Lef Lesson 55, Architecture Decision Records. Again, my name is Mark Richards, and thank you so much for listening.